In the year 2000, I was 25 years old, and I was leading the collegiate ministry at First Baptist Church in Nashville. And in that year, uh, May of that year, I took about 30 of our college students uh, over to Memphis, Tennessee, for an event called Passion One Day. And there was about 40,000 people at this event. It was out in a huge field just outside of Memphis. And uh, at that gathering of 40,000 college students, I heard one of the most profound sermons that I've ever heard. I believe it's one of the most transformative sermons that my generation has ever heard. It was given by John Piper. It was called Boasting Only in the Cross of Christ. And several years after he preached that sermon, he wrote a book Uh, entitled Don't Waste Your Life, which includes many of the illustrations and points that he used in that sermon. And this morning, I want to begin by reading just a portion of that book because I believe it ties directly in to the message and to the parable that we're going to read in just a few minutes from Matthew chapter 25. I want you to hear these words. Imagine them being spoken over a group of 40,000 young college students, many of whom were trying to decide how they were going to spend their life, whether they were going to be doctors or nurses, whether they were going to be teachers, whether they were going to serve in the trade industry, whether they were going to go to the military. What, how were they going to spend their life? What were they going to spend the next 50 years of their lives doing? Here's what he says. He says, you may not be sure uh, that you want your life to make a difference. Maybe you don't care very much whether you make a lasting difference for the sake of something great. You just want people to like you. If people would just like being around you, you'd be satisfied. Or if you could have a good job with a good wife or husband and a couple of good kids and a nice car and long weekends and a few good friends and a fun retirement and a quick and easy death and no hell, if you could have all of that even without God, you would be satisfied. That is a tragedy in the making a wasted life. In April 2000, Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards were killed in Cameroon, West Africa. Ruby was over 80, single all of her life. She poured it out for one great thing, to make Jesus Christ known among the unreached, the poor, and the sick. Laura was a widow, a medical doctor, pushing 80 years old and serving at Ruby's side in Cameroon. The brakes failed, the car went over a cliff, and they were both killed instantly. I asked my congregation, was that a tragedy? Two lives driven by one great passion, namely to spend an unheralded service to the perishing poor for the glory of Jesus Christ, even two decades after the most of their American counterparts had retired to throw away their lives on trifles. No, that is not a tragedy. That is a glory. These lives were not wasted and these lives were not lost. I will tell you what a tragedy is. I will show you how to waste your life. Consider a story from the February 1998 edition of Reader's Digest, which tells about a couple who took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. At first when I read it, I thought it might be a joke, a spoof on the American dream, but it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life, and let the great work of your life before you give an account to your Creator be this, playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them before Christ at the great day of judgment. Look, Lord, see my seashells. That is a tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. Over against that, I put my protest. Don't buy it. Don't waste your life. Profound and true. And the message that it is driven from comes out of a beautiful passage in Matthew 25, where Jesus has been talking about his return. He's been saying, I am coming back. You do not know the day nor the hour, and therefore, what do you need to do? You need to be ready all of the time. Whether I come today or whether I delay, you are to be ready. You are to live ready. And so what does it look like to live ready? Well, in this parable today, we're going to see Jesus explain how we invest our lives in the kingdom. So if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 
25, Matthew chapter 25, and I invite you this morning to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. I will begin in verse 14. You probably are familiar with this parable, but it is profound and it is rich. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he, also, he who, and he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you, ha you can have what is yours. But the master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested the money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest." So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be more given, and he who has an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken from him. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, we thank you for this profound parable of which we can see how we are to invest our lives. And it is certainly not in seashells and softball. Father, it is in the kingdom. It is pouring our lives out until we take our last breath on this earth or until you return. We are to pour our lives out, as the Apostle Paul said, as a drink offering so that there's not one to drop left. At the moment that we die, we put it all out there for you. And Father, when we do so, we will reap the abundant reward of being in your presence and having all of the joy that comes with knowing you intimately. Father, may we not miss you in this life. Father, I pray if there's someone out there today wondering and pondering how to spend their life, how to invest their life in the things that truly matter, that today you would speak clearly to them. Father, I pray if there's anyone in this room who's yet to come to the very purpose of their life, they're still struggling with, with why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? What is the purpose of this whole thing? That in this parable, in this truth, through, your power, through the power of your Holy Spirit, the, that you would speak to them about their desperate need for faith in Christ. For our purpose and meaning is found not in the things of this world, but in our Creator. And so, Father, may we find you today. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you. You are my rock and my redeemer, and I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I was doing a little research on talents, and I realized or discovered that a talent in the first century would be worth about, listen to this, $200,000 in today's money. That's a lot of money, isn't it? $200,000. I don't have $200,000, and so I don't even have the one talent, right? Now, his master was obviously very rich because he had a lot of talents to pass out, right? So if you start to do the math, right, the average income for Kettering for a family in 2018 was about $57,000, household income. So in the first century, that would be worth about three and a half to four years worth of income. So imagine just having to work the next three and a half to four years, but instead of working it, that some money, that lump of money was given to you, and you are told, invest this for the master. 
give this uh, uh, your attention and produce something with it. So when the master returns, and we don't know when he's going to return, that's part of the point of the parable, right? They didn't know when he was going to return, so they had to be ready at any point. They were investing it. So what does it mean to invest in the kingdom? Well, not only do we have resources to invest, we also have time to invest, right? The average lifespan in the United States this year is about 79 years, right? A little less for men, a little more for women. That comes out to about 28,854 days. Some of you have used up some of those more than others. But the point is, you don't know if today's the last one. You don't know if this is day 28,853 or not. So you better keep pouring it out. You better keep investing it until you know that it's the last day. So when I'm thinking about this parable, I'm thinking about it in the context of how we spend our lives. How we invest what the King has given us. I want to give you this morning five points that I think will help drive home the truth of this text. And the first one is this. Living ready means never forget forgetting who we are living for. If we're living ready, we are constantly thinking about who we are living for. Who is the master, right? If we're going to invest well, we have to know the master, we got to know what the expectations of the master are. we got to have a relationship with the master. Look at verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. You see the possession there. Who do the servants belong to? The master. Who does the possessions belong to? The master. You realize it is the same in our lives. You do not own yourself. You are not your own boss. The boss is your boss, right? At our house, we've gone through this many times. All kids are getting older now, but when they were young, they'd always play this game. So, so who's the boss of the house? You know, they would start off with, is, am I the boss? No, you're not the boss. I mean, assure you, you're not the boss. <laughs> there could be a lot of confusion about a lot of things in our house, but we're not confused about that. So you're not the boss. Well, is mom the boss? Well, mom can be the boss over you. Well, is dad the boss? Well, dad can be the boss. But dad's not the ultimate boss. See, mom and dad submit themselves to Christ. Christ is the boss of this house. We do what Christ says. We do what Jesus instructs us to do. He is the true boss. He has given us a stewardship as parents over you while you're young. So yes, in some senses we are your boss, but we are only proxy bosses for the boss, right? Right? We're only standing in while you're little, and we're trying to teach you what the boss is saying. But we belong to him, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Not only do you not own your life, you don't own anything. You hear me? I don't own anything. The very breath that I breathe, the very air that's coming into my lungs does not belong to me. It is a gracious gift of God. This building... This pulpit, this Bible, this world is a gift from God. The fact that he doesn't annihilate us the moment we're born in our sin is a gift from God. If you've lived one day, it's a gift from God. The fact that many of us are gathered in this place healthy means you have something to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. The fact that you have a roof over your head and clothes on your body means you have something to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. It's been a hard year. I mean, that's all. I've not met anybody who goes, hey, this is the best year ever. It's been a hard year. It has been a trying year. It has been a, a difficult challenge to navigate he the health situation, politics, all of the stuff that we've walked through together this year. It has been challenging in so many different ways. But here's the reality. We have a lot to be thankful for. And we have to focus on what we are thankful for. Because if we don't, the world will tell you all of the things that you should be upset about. All the things you should be angry about. All the stuff that should really bother you. And there, are stuff, there is stuff, and I'm not trying to say everything's peachy and rosy, but my goodness, you have far more things to be thankful for. Do you have a relationship with Jesus today? If you do, you have the greatest gift that's ever been given. I think that's a reason to be thankful. There's people around the world today that have never heard the name of Jesus. So if you've heard the name of Jesus, 
you have something to be thankful for today. So everything belongs to him. Psalm 50, verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine. Don't you love that? He's the creator. Every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all of the birds of the hills. And all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world in its fullness are mine. That's what the Lord says. If he owns the cattle on the thousand hills and he, uh, and, he, and he owns the birds of the trees, then he certainly owns us. We are his possession. And so living ready means we must not forget who we belong to and who we live for. The second thing I think we, should ought, to, we ought to see in this parable is that living ready means accepting personal responsibility for the opportunities we've been given. Accepting responsibility for the opportunities we've been given. Every one of us has been given an opportunity. You've been given an opportunity this morning. Did I get up and come to church? Do I turn it on and watch it online? Or do I just go about my business? You've been given an opportunity. How are you going to spend your day? Who are you going to talk to? Who are you going to ignore? Who are you going to reach out to? Am I going to spend time praying and talking to God this morning? What am I going to do? Right? I've been given opportunity today. His mercies are new every morning. What am I going to do with them? Well, look at verse 15. To one he gave five talents. There's an opportunity. To another he gave two. <clears throat> another opportunity. And to another one. Another opportunity. To each according to his ability. Then he went away. Now, I think we oftentimes put too much emphasis or too much attention on that idea about, well, he gave one of five, and he gave one of them two, and he gave one of them one. That doesn't seem very fair, right? We live in a fair society, right? We want everything to be fair. But the reality is he's given them according to their ability, and if they were to produce and to produce the results with what he had given, he would give them more, right? He gave more to those who were successful. Now, let's think about this for a second. He gave them according to their ability. Oftentimes, we think about that in the context of, well, he gave one five and gave one two and gave one one. But the reality is he knows what he expects of each of us, and he doesn't expect the same thing from each of us, from, from everyone, right? He doesn't expect the same thing from me as he expects from you. He expects things different from you than he does from me. I tell this to my kids all the time, because they'll say, well, that's not fair. She got that, or he got to do that. You're different. You have different gifts. You have different skills. You have different abilities. We might pay for one of our kids to be in piano lessons, but we don't go to our other kid and go, you have to take piano lessons because that's fair. They might want to play sports. Okay, we'll, we'll let you play sports. We'll pay to have a coach. Da, da. See, we're saying it's not equal. It's just different. It's an investment in each of them, but it's not the same investment in each of them. We look at what they like, what they're good at, what, they're, what their talents are, and we put resources and time and effort into that. And if we do it well, they will be satisfied. The one who was given one talent, if, if he would have invested it and produced two talents out of it, he would have walked away satisfied. It's kind of like this example. Let's say you go to a buffet, and I don't know if buffets are ever coming back in our culture again. But let's just pretend you went to a buffet, right? And I gave one, uh, well, there's three of you in line, and I gave one of you five plates, one of you two plates, and one of you one plate. And I said to you, you can go and put as much food as you want on your plate, right? So if you have five, you can load up five plates of food. But here's the catch. You only have one period of time. Let's say it's 15 minutes to eat it, right? So you can fill up your five plates, and you start eating, right? Well, you're probably not going to finish five plates. You're probably going to finish one plate, and you're going to be completely full if you filled it up. And the guy who got two plates, he's going to finish what? One plate and be completely full. And the other one's going to get their one plate, and if he ate it, he would be completely full. Now, you don't go, the guy who's got one plate, and he's completely full, and he's pushed back from the table, and he goes, oh, that was so good. He doesn't look down at the guy who got five and goes, well, he got a lot more than I did. Because he's full, and he's satisfied. He got what, what he needed, and he is content in that. And the guy who doesn't go down here, who's got four plates that he barely even touched, he goes, whew, I'm a lot better off than that guy down there. No, he's going, I'm full too. 
And the guy in the middle, I'm full too. You see, we can be satisfied with whatever God has given us if we will invest it well because we'll be so busy putting our time, talent, and treasure into what God has given us, we won't be looking and worried about what these people are doing. You see, when we get in trouble, it's when we start going, I wonder what he got. Why, why, why is his job pay more than my job? I wonder why he's a good speaker and I'm not a good speaker. I wonder why she's a good writer and I'm not a good writer. I wonder why he's good at science and I stink at science. I wonder why he can play that instrument and I can't play this. We're too busy looking at other people instead of just putting our focus on Christ and pursuing what he's given us and investing ourselves in that. So living ready means accepting personal responsibility for the opportunity. What am I going to do with my life? I'm not responsible for what you're going to do with your life. You've got to make those choices. But I'll give an account, not for you, but for me. Now I'll have to give an account and say, how did I shepherd you? But I'm not responsible for every choice that you make, just as you're not for me. See, living ready means accepting responsibility. Third, living ready means investing our lives in things that produce spiritual fruit. We have to invest our lives in things that produce spiritual fruit. Look at verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Now, one thing you can take away is there will be a settling of accounts. You and I will give an account of our life. We will be asked what we have done with our time, talent, and treasure. What did we do with the king's stuff? It says, verse 20, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five more. He's doubled them, right? A good investment strategy. He took the gifts and talents and he poured them into the kingdom. And he was able to produce kingdom results, spiritual fruit. And so when the king came back, he said, look, here's the, here's the mission trips that I went on. Here's the money I gave to Lottie Moon. Here's the time I poured in discipling people. Here are the people I shared the gospel with. Here is the kids that I raised in my home well. Here is the, 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 the workplace where I gave myself to making a difference to being salt and light. This is what I've done with my life. And the Lord looks out and says, oh, yes, exactly. And then you have the guy who has two talents. And the same thing happens. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. Now one thing that I love about this is he says the, the same thing uh, to, the, to the guys and no matter what they have, right? So the guy who had five talents, you have been faithful over a little. Now remember what I told you a talent was. $200,000. And what does the Lord tell him? You've been faithful over a little. The guy took $200,000. Right, per talent. So, what is that? Two times five, a hundred, what, a million dollars, and doubled it to two million dollars. And what does he say? You've been faithful over a little. You see, when we understand how much God owns, then we'll understand the, how little that is. You see how sometimes we get caught up in the numbers, the bigness of the numbers, but the bigness of the numbers are nothing to God. And same thing with start measuring time. Well, you know. 28,854 days, that's a lot of days. Not to God. $2 million, that's a lot of money. Not to God. He says, you've been faithful over a little. Now he says this, I will set you over much. Okay, if that's a little, what's much? What's much? But in the kingdom... God will give responsibility to us. The problem for a lot of us is we want all the responsibility, but none of the stewardship. We, we want to be in charge over big things. We want big ministry opportunities to come our way. And God says, you haven't been faithful with the little. It's funny, I teach oftentimes for different, in different seminaries and such occasionally, and you, you always get young pastor guys who imagine that they're going to roll out of seminary at 25 and take a megachurch. I guess it could happen, but it doesn't happen often, let me assure you. And, and they think, well, I, I've been to school. i got all these talents. And why would the Lord give you that kind of responsibility when you haven't been faithful with that small youth group? Why would the Lord give you that responsibility when you haven't been faithful with that volunteer ministry you've been running at the food pantry? You see, what God's looking for is people who are faithful, who will take what he's given them, a little opportunity, and make it more. Invest well in it spend their lives pouring into it. 
And then as they develop and as he develops them and as they prove their faithfulness, what does he do? Oftentimes, he'll increase that. Not always. Because sometimes he just calls you to the, the small. Sometimes he calls you to the things that, you, that other people don't recognize, but are, they're actually making a gigantic difference. I've known some people that have poured themselves into what we would consider little bitty ministries. Things that we would think, oh gosh, you know, they're not preaching to the thousands. They're not sending missionaries across the world. They're just down there serving in that food pantry. God knows and God sees, and we will have no idea on this side of heaven what kind of impact we've made. But God is looking for faithfulness. He's looking for people who will pour their lives into what he's called them to do and then trust him with the results. See, living ready means investing our lives not in the things that produce worldly fruit, It's not about getting the softball game. It's not about a humongous seashell collection. It's not about the 30-foot trawler. It's about being able to present your life to the Lord as a sacrifice, saying, I poured it out for you. Luke chapter 12, verse 48, the end of that verse says this, Everyone to whom was much given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand more. Fourth, failure to live ready exposes our true feelings about the master and his calling on our lives. When we do not walk faithfully, when we do not invest ourselves in the kingdom, it says a whole lot about what we think about the master. Look at me at verse 24. He who had also received the one talent came forward saying, master, I knew you to be a hard man. Right? Immediately, this guy who was given one and buried it in the ground, he begins to project his true feelings about the master's heart. You're a hard man. You, you reap where you did not sow, and you gather where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. See, this is not a person who walked in the joy of the Lord. This is a person who walked with animosity towards the Lord. It's not the, the, the kind of fear that's a holy reverent fear. It's a, oh my goodness, I just don't want to lose it, Right? I'm just not going to mess it up, and I'll just bury it in the ground. I don't want to, I don't want to get the wrath of God on me for, for losing his stuff, for taking a risk. I've never met anybody in the kingdom who did anything significant for eternity that didn't take a risk. Because doing things for the Lord has risk to it. You might risk your reputation. You might risk your your finances. You might risk your family. You might risk something. But there's always some risk. It's not easy sailing. And some people just say, I'm going to play it safe. I don't want to uproot the family. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I've never talked to a single missionary who's been overseas, who said, hey, you know, this is a piece of cake. No risk involved here. I've never met any pastor who said, oh, you know what? Piece of cake, easiest job in the world. No risk here. I've never met any Sunday school teacher who has gotten, who has gotten no calls from church members from the two Sunday school class saying, hey, can you come out and help me? And you've got to sacrifice some time with your family. I've never even met anybody who says, I have all the money in the world. I'll just keep pouring it into kingdom things. No, there's risk involved, right? If I do this, I can't do that. If I give this, I can't give that. If everything's a choice. What are we risking for the kingdom? And if we have a genuine faith with the Lord, if we're faith walkers and we believe, I'm going to trust God with the unknown. I don't know how this is going to end. I don't know if this is going to be completely safe. I, I love the prayer that the disciples prayed in the book of Acts after they had been caught sharing the name of Jesus and the authorities came to them and said, stop talking about Jesus. And they prayed this prayer, and in this prayer they said, God, give us boldness. Give us boldness. Why pray for boldness if there is no risk? You pray for boldness because you understand there may be consequences for the choices that you make, for the pouring of yourself out in the kingdom. There may be risk involved. But what it says is what we truly believe about God. When we bury our talent in the ground, we're basically saying, God does not matter to me what he's told me to do. I'm not doing it. I'm not giving myself. I'm not pouring myself. It's not a big deal. God's not sincere about these things. He says this in verse 26. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful 
servant. You know that word slothful? I think there's a lot of lazy Christians. There's a lot of lazy Christians. They don't want to work in the kingdom. They would rather watch TV, surf the internet, play golf, do nothing, do only things for themselves, nothing for the kingdom, because they're just lazy. And I'm not pointing any fingers to anyone in this room. Only God can, can reveal whether or not you fall into that category. But imagine if the, the millions of Christians around the world got serious and got to work evangelizing people, sharing the gospel with people, taking the gospel around the world. It's hard work. You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money. If you know that there's reward and punishment, then you ought to have made a better choice. My friend, there is reward and there is punishment. How we live our lives really does matter. How we spend what God has entrusted us to really does matter. How we use our time, talents, time and talents really does matter. There are eternal things that hang on those choices. And that leads to number five. Failure to live ready has catastrophic and eternal consequences. Look at verse 28. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will be more given. And he who has will have an abundance. Now, let me stop right here. This is not prosperity gospel. Let me just pause right there. It's not this, this idea that you will be given more stuff for you to use for your pleasure. It's back to the idea of you will be given increasing responsibility to steward God's things. So it's not, hey, if you give to the church, you're going to get this back, right? It's not if you give $10, God's going to give you $50 to spend on yourself. That's prosperity gospel. If I do this, then God will return my health. That's prosperity gospel. That's not what this is teaching. This is teaching that if you invest your life in the kingdom, you will be given more to invest in the kingdom, Not for yourself, not for your pleasures, not for your agenda, but for the kingdom. Remember, it's not yours. It's the king's. He goes on and he says, but for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, sometimes we, uh, because we've taken, you know, a year over a year to go through the book of Matthew, sometimes we can forget how often God talks about heaven and, ta- and hell, all right? So I just compil- compiled a few of the verses just from Matthew where Jesus talks about consequences for not trusting him, consequences for not walking with him, consequences for not investing yourself in the kingdom. And I'm just going to read them to you. I'm going to let God's word speak to you directly itself. Matthew 5, 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Matthew 8, 11. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 13, 41. 
The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place there will be gnashing of teeth. Matthew 18, 9. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better, to you to, better for you to enter, the kingdom, enter life with one eye than two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. Matthew 23, 33. You're serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Matthew 24, 50. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour in which he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, hell, my friends, is a real place. Jesus talks about it. He warns about it. He tells us that our lives matter and that there is eternity at stake. There is a real place called heaven and it is paradise. And in Revelation we read that in that place there is no tears. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. There is no coronavirus. Amen? But there's also a real place called hell. And it's fiery. And it's painful. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see the contrast? In heaven there is no tears. But in hell there is weeping. And where we spend eternity has to do with one thing and one thing alone. Have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe that He is the one and only Son of God, the Messiah? Do you believe that He lived a perfect and sinless life? Do you believe that He died on a cross at the hands of the Romans? That He was buried in the grave and on the third day He bodily and physically rose from that grave demonstrating His power over sin and death and that His death on the cross was the payment for your sin because the Scripture tells us that we are sinners. Every single one of us has done what is wrong in the eyes of God. Every one of us have disobeyed God, and therefore we deserve the wrath of God. We deserve the place called hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But by the goodness and grace of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, He took our place. He paid our death by dying in our place. And the Scripture says that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And those who have been given eternal life, listen to this, they will serve Him. Our lives display our faith. Our lives are a reflection of what we actually believe. We can say a lot of things. But our lives display what we actually believe. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith and trust in Him? Are you living your life not to to gain eternal life, that was given to you by Christ, but as a display of the fact that you've been given that gift of eternal life? Are you investing yourself in the kingdom? I don't know about you, but I... And I don't know how much time I have left. I'm 45, so I'm already, if 79 is the halfway part, Mark, I'm past there. So I'm in the the second half. Some of you are in the last lap. Some of you are in the first lap, right? We we don't know when our lap is because we don't know how long our race is. I mean, I'm just picking 79 because it's the average, but some of you ain't making it to 79. Some of you are making it to 100. Some of you might not make it to 50. I don't know. Here's what I do know. We ought to wake up every day and number one, thank the Lord Jesus we have another breath. Second, we ought to wake up every day saying, God, how do you want to use me today? How can I serve you today? What can I do with my time, talent, and treasure that's really yours to invest in your kingdom so that somebody else might have the opportunity to spend eternity with you? That's how I want to wake up every day. If I'm a real lifer, I'll tell you, I I don't always do that every day, but I want to do that every day. It's my desire to do that every day. And I'm trying to pursue Christ in such a way that that would be what happens every day. And I would invite you to join me in that pursuit. But before you can do that, you have to put your faith and trust in Him. 
Because you'll never be able to pursue those things. Your heart will never be inclined to those things if you first don't have a a relationship with your heavenly Father and then realize how much he loves you and what he's done for you in his son Jesus. So I invite you this morning, would you put your faith and trust in him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. And Father, I'm sure that there are some in this room and certainly some watching online who have never trusted in the Lord Jesus. They've never called upon his name for their salvation. They've tried to work things out. They've tried to do good deeds. They may think that they're trying to do them for the sake of the kingdom. But really, Father, we know that oftentimes our good deeds are nothing but filthy rags. We'll never be able to satisfy you with what we do. So we must trust in the name of Jesus, the only one who's lived perfectly and sinlessly, who has provided salvation to all who would believe. Father, would you stir someone's heart to faith this morning? Would you stir someone's heart to faith in this room? Would you stir someone's heart to faith online? That as they've heard the gospel, they would ask the question, do I know Jesus? And if not, would they call upon his name in this moment? And then, Father, for those of us who do know you, who have called upon your name, who have received the gift of eternal life, may we look in the mirror today and ask the question, are we pouring our lives out for the sake of the gospel, for the investment in the kingdom, or, Father, are we looking at just making our lives more comfortable and more easy? Are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to take a risk? Are we willing to pour ourselves into the things of the kingdom for the sake of the King? Father, help us to trust your word that reminds us that the joy of obedience and the joy of sacrifice is greater than anything else. Father, stir in our hearts. We need your spirit. For these are hard words and they go against everything that the world teaches. So Satan will be working double time to convince us it's not important. So Father, stir our hearts to what is true and right today. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.